The Lord be with you. Hello, my dear ones, and welcome to this week's episode of the vlog. I'm so grateful to have you tuned in. Please remember to like, share and subscribe as that really does help the channel grow. And it aids us in our mission here in reaching more people for Christ and helping folks to interpret uh, big Christian news stories and other stories through a biblical lens. So I really appreciate all the work you guys put into helping to spread the content of this little channel. It's, it's quite astonishing. Uh, we've cracked 14,000 and the response was really positive to the concept of having a Bible Q&A or sending in some questions and having me answer those questions if we hit 15,000. So please push on uh, and let your friends and family know uh, about this channel. Uh, and the little statistics thing here, Bobby, tells me that quite a few people who uh, view the channel don't subscribe. So if you find this content to be enriching or edifying or is blessing you in the Lord Jesus, uh, may I encourage you please to subscribe. Uh, okay, on with the news stories for this week. We have quite a few uh, and mostly coming out of English Anglicanism. Uh, and there's one fairly ridiculous one at the end. So the Church of England appears to be facing not only a shortage of vicars, but now a shortage of lay people as volunteers in their parishes, which is to be expected considering the sharp decline in attendance. That means that only the stalwarts who are ever increasing in age, who have been faithful for years and years to keep the parishes running, are going to hang around and remain. Uh, and that's really difficult in what we call an interregnum, where there's no vicar. And as I said, there is a distinct lack of vicars these days. So people are really getting fed up. But uh, a, a report in The Telegraph seemed to suggest that, in fact, they weren't just fed up because of lack of manpower. They were also getting fed up with the woke nonsense, uh, particularly in rural areas, uh, in churches which have sort of held the line and proclaimed the gospel up and down the country around the parish network for uh, over a thousand years. These sort of backbone parishes of the Church of England your average Joe and Jane in the pews really isn't interested in this woke garbage. They really do want to just go back to the basics of preaching the gospel, learning from the Bible, and fellowshipping together as Christians and having a sense of genuine Christian community. And sadly for a lot of them, either they don't have a minister or they've got some sort of woke lefty as their minister, and they just get fed up. They get mistreated by the clergy. They're tired of the diocesan uh, hierarchy, wasting money, and it's just you know, frivolously throwing cash away on these sort of virtue signaling vanity projects that dioceses and bishops tend to be fond of these days in the CV. And the poor sods are just sick of it. They're just sick of it. Uh, it's up to a quarter now, uh, the article reads, of CV parishes don't have church wardens. Now, if you're not from an Anglican tradition, you probably won't know what that is. That's, I guess, kind of similar to an elder. That's one of the oldest uh, positions in the Anglican Church in, in terms of the laity. The church warden is responsible for, uh, along with the vicar, the keeping of what they call the fabric of the building. In other words, keeping the building up to scratch, keep making sure worship runs smoothly each week, uh, doing all that sort of nitty-gritty practical stuff. They are essential to the functioning of a healthy parish, and up to a quarter of the parishes in the Church of England now do not have a church warden. Uh, I found this in my time in the C of E. It was getting increasingly hard to get people to be church warden and very hard to get people to put their hand up. And another problem people face is uh, that when good wardens come to retire, there aren't many good Christians left to replace them. And sometimes it's sort of a power vacuum and folks who are a bit power hungry or don't have the character to take on a role of Christian leadership, unfortunately get in the job and, you know, they cause a bit of problems for people. Uh, bullying and nastiness and gossiping and things like that. So it's only going to get worse as the C of E shrinks, but it's very sad to see because the innocent people in the pews, they didn't foist this woke stuff on the C of E. It's the hierarchy that have done this. Uh, they haven't caused the erosion in attendance. It's the hierarchy abandoning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and the, well, there's a spiritual aspect that God won't bless wickedness, but there's also the aspect that People out there in the general populace of the UK are just fed up with the C of E. Even if they don't want to be Christians, they're not, not believers in Christ, they're not interested in church, there is a general feeling out there that just church should act like church, Christians should behave like Christians, rather than sort of this constant appeasement to the world. 
So uh, this is a pretty tragic kind of uh, outworking, I suppose you could say, of the freefall decline. And there is some there are some charts here talking about uh, parishes and their growth on, on online, and it's it's pretty damning to see, as we've talked about previously on this channel, the absolute cliff that attendance is now going off. But uh, that was posted to the Telegraph on the 18th of March, and then on the 19th, the very next day, there was another story in the Telegraph by a different journalist, which was speaking about how the Church of England treats its volunteers uh, abominably, abominably, uh, which is quite an interesting thing uh, because it's revealing now that even the secular news media are aware that things are not particularly healthy, not all the bed of roses in the CV. It's a deeply divided church, a church which has got one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. Uh, it's attempting to sort of mix light and darkness. Uh, and the Telegraph article says that there was one church warden who commented on the Telegraph's story about church wardens uh, claiming that they had had their visitation from the archdeacon who spent time basically berating them about woke virtue signaling. Uh, and it's just, they were fed up with it. They said, okay, I quit. I hang up my warden's staff. I'm not interested. This is really, really bad because um, I feel really sorry for the rank and file, biblical, faithful, old school Anglicans in the English countryside who have been, you know, part of the fabric of English country life for a thousand years or more. And this will mean, uh, you know, an increased rapidity in the decline of the parish network. There's no denying that, uh, which is very, very sad. And that will actually mean that buildings will start to fall into increased disrepair as there, as there are less and less watchful eyes with experience in maintaining these beautiful heritage buildings, keeping an eye on them, which is the job of a, a skilled and gifted church warden. It, it is heartbreaking to me. People, people sometimes think because I've left the C of E, I'm, I'm angry about, I'm not angry at all. I, I don't resent them. I've forgiven them for what they did to me, but I, I still weep. I mourn. I lament. I cry. And I point this stuff out in this little channel for two reasons. To help people to find a biblical church home, just to get out of Dodge, and hopefully, maybe, to cause some form of repentance. Who knows? But it is going to be a hard slog ahead for those people who are in the parish system. And, you know, with ideas going around like Minster communities and mission communities, these sort of mega parish models where they're merging together dozens upon dozens upon dozens of churches, spreading vicars around them. It's really, really not a very New Testament model of running a church. It's not the traditional British or English model of running a church. And it does just seem like they're going to spiral into an administrative nightmare of selling off more and more churches, of closing the doors on more and more congregations. And I'm sad to say you reap what you sow. That's what happens when you walk away from biblical fidelity. And that's what is one of the consequences, sad as it might be. So if you're in a Church of England parish, would you like to sound off in the comments? Do you have a church warden in your church or two church wardens? Uh, how are you going for volunteers? Are you finding that people are rolling their sleeves up and helping or is it really a strain now on a decreasing and aging group of people? And another aspect is, as well is that there are, there are so few organists left to play music. This is why I'm keenly aware of the blessing that God's put on Emmanuel Church because we've all made a stand for righteousness. Basically everyone at Emmanuel is a Bible-believing Christian who has left from uh, apostatized or backsliding denominations. And they found a church family that they belong in. It's loving, it's faithful, but it's also uh, unequivocally Christian. And we are exceedingly blessed by God because of the stand for truth we make. And we make it very boldly and very openly and publicly and get plenty of, I personally get plenty of complaints about it, but that's what happens. We cop flack from the devil when you're over the target uh, of the evil one. He's not happy. And I tell you what, we are incredibly blessed, not only with loads of people at our church and more people coming uh, month on month, but we are amazingly gifted by God with uh, two very faithful church wardens. One's my wife, so she's obviously faithful. <laughs> I'm biased, I have to say that. The other is my dear friend, 
and brother in Christ, Michael, who is incredibly skilled uh, in just about every form of DIY and is an excellent church warden and, a, and on, most importantly, uh, a family man and a man of God. And then uh, we have a fantastic organist who is training other people to play the organ at church. Uh, we have a great church council. We have folks who are willing to roll up their sleeves and clean and set up for services. And I've never been in a church that's such a hub and a hive of activity of people who just want to help because they love God and they love their church. And even just today, uh, folks from church were saying to me, this is the first time we felt like we've belonged in a church family, a genuine family since 1985. That was the year I was born, by the way, which really moved my heart. And it was just, they, they were thanking me and I said, don't, don't thank me. I'm just some silly Australian. Thank Jesus uh, that he honors those who stand firm on his word. So I can't imagine, I mean, I saw a bit of it in the C of V as I was the last couple of years, but for the whole, for the, for the, for the whole, in all my parishes in the C of V, I had some pretty darn good church wardens, but I can't imagine how difficult it is being in a parish with no church wardens or being in a parish with no vicar or both, neither, uh, and how hard that would be as a congregation, particularly if they're a biblical, faithful congregation and they've got, you know, a woke bishop over them peddling this sort of, and hierarchy and peddling this garbage. So please pray for these people who are left in the pews. My prayer is that they just become Christian refugees and leave and come to the Free Church of England. Uh, but I know that's not likely to be the case for everybody. Okay, next story. The Church of England continues down its path of tackling white fragility, whatever that means, uh, and pushing for more diversity in the church and the church's racial um, unit or racial justice unit or something. It sounds a bit like the special crimes unit or something from Law and Order SVU. Uh, they are doubling down. They've received so much criticism and for out, outright mockery, really. They've been mocked pretty harshly uh, by people with uh, sensible, normal brains. Uh, they have said, basically, we are going to double down, even though people have been absolutely uh, really having a field day pulling this thing apart after the Diocese of Birmingham, some Midland diocese which, diocese, which I reported on previously, went in for this sort of uh, whiteness officer type person, you know, uh, tackling the great evil of whiteness, which to me, as I said before, it just seems like kind of reverse racism. The gospel does not require these silly virtue signaling jobs. You know, there's a, a team of 11, uh, some of them are being paid up to 36,000 pounds per annum. Uh, it's, it's just ludicrous. You don't need this if you actually teach and preach the Bible because for true Christians, there is no such thing as racism. We cannot participate in it. It is a vile thing. And the Church of England has affirmed that. It's vile and disgusting to be racist. But then, instead of using the gospel and the Bible, which reconciles everybody together under one banner in Christ to resolve this, because we're all one race, the human race. There are only ethnicities. There's not a different race. Uh, they they go to this woke virtue signaling, critical race theory stuff, which sort of seems so American. It seems like it comes out of the States, you know, where everything's filtered through a lens of whether you're black or you're white or you're oppressed or you're not. And, and this is all cultural Marxism in the mix. And lo and behold, the Church of England goes to that to resolve their perceived issue with racism instead of going back to the basics of teaching what the Bible says about race, which is very clearly that there's no room for racism when everyone's made in the image of God. Uh, and everyone is fallen, just as Adam fell, our, our forefather, and everyone can be redeemed in Jesus Christ, the new Adam, if they believe on him for their salvation. That's the answer to racism. There's no, there's no need to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on a team of people who want to tackle white fragility. There's no need to do that or to have sort of diversity hires and get a certain quota of uh, people of a certain ethnicity or uh, a certain quota of women uh, priestesses just to satisfy ticking these boxes and feel like they're being very virtuous. Uh, this is all the sort of cult of nice stuff, which is actually nothing to do with biblical Christianity. But interestingly enough, in the, the ebb and flow of this story in the last month or so, um, although the racial unity team or inclusion team or whatever they're called, I couldn't care less, but 
for the sake of this story, uh, I think their racial unity team, well, they may have doubled down, but Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, has taken a stab at this whiteness officer, you know, uh, role in, in the Midlands Diocese, in the West Midlands. And he has been interviewed, <laughs> which is interesting because he's doing a lot of media stuff lately to try and sort of get himself out there and, and, and look like the everyman, you know, and look like he's, he's one of you in the pews. Uh, although he was, you know, wholeheartedly in support of blessing same-sex marriages and bringing God's judgment in down on the church at the Synod. And he continually uh, appoints the most far-left, woke people that you can possibly find in the C into its significant positions in the C of E. But anyway, <laughs> uh, what was happening was that yet again, Justin was on uh, an interview and he was asked point blank what he thought about this. And he was pretty, pretty skeptical of it. Uh, this deconstructing whiteness role, he said, didn't, didn't really know what that actually meant. And apparently he'd rung the diocese of Birmingham and told them as much and said, hey, this is a bit weird. What's your, what's your deal with this? So it's intriguing that even Justin Welby is doing this. Now, the more cynical amongst us I saw on my, uh, my Facebook the, the, today were saying, ah, look, he's only saying this because he wants to sort of, sort of pony up to the remaining few people in the pews who are uh, you know, regular, normal Christians and try and win them over. But he actually secretly agrees with it uh, because he's, everything else he's shown along the way has been outstandingly woke and this is just part and parcel of that it's a bit too little too late Justin to start sort of questioning what this is now because the Pandora's box uh, of liberalism and progressivism uh, and heresy and apostasy has been opened in the C of E and doesn't matter if the lid even got put back on all the monsters are out now and they're wreaking havoc okay tell me what you think of Justin Welby taking a pot shot at the deconstructing whiteness officer in the West Midland Diocese. Uh, do you think he was being sincere? Do you think his motive was true uh, when he was doing this Radio Times interview? Or was he just trying to gain a bit of popularity after quite a few weeks, months, and perhaps even years of constantly taking bad press? Right, the next story is that over 100,000 Christians, uh, well, people, but I presume mostly Christians, have signed a petition asking the UK government to please uh, reduce the abortion legal limit down to 22 weeks. And this comes on the coattails of some amazing scientific evidence which reveals that premature babies as young as 22 weeks can uh, reasonably survive outside the womb and have a higher chance if they've had some prenatal care. So, you know what, this uh, is a highlight of just how evil abortion is, to remind her how evil it is. Those babies are fully human. They're made in the image of God. It is murder to abort a baby. But we love to twist the language. Uh, well, we don't. The evil one loves to twist the language and to soften it and to hide it behind other words. But just call a spade a spade. I am an absolute abolitionist for abortion. I think it should be banned uh, and that we should have uh, robust systems in our society in place to care for mothers who do not want their pregnancy, to have a robust adoption system, and to equip parents to actually raise their own children would be amazing. Um, there's obviously some absolutely massive societal change that needs to take place for all of that to occur, but uh, abortion and murdering children is not the answer. That is 100% not the answer. And it's interesting that um, so many people signed this, and so many people were petitioning all of the MPs in the UK Parliament to ensure that this is lowered because I think it was back in 97 they lowered it by a, a few weeks because I think from 28 to 24 weeks because of advances in medical science being able to keep children alive if they were born so premature so I, I get this was all put together by Right for Life UK I get why they're doing it because any little win any bit of ground we can gain on destroying this vile and evil idol which has stricken our culture and was frankly has brought on the wrath of God upon Britain uh, and on the West where this evil is practiced. Uh, I get any win is good and we should push for that. But I, even if it gets through and even if the parliamentarians uh, do lower the date of um, abortion, I, pff, I just want it gone. 
I, I, I know that might sound really unrealistic. I just get so emotional about this. I get so angry for the poor mothers who are wounded and tricked into thinking that this is healthcare and lied to by the pernicious evil of feminism. And I get so, so, so sad and cut up. I'm many an hour I've spent in prayer all the way back to my time when I was a, 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 a seminarian in Melbourne studying at Bible College and I was part of uh, abolish human abortion and we would do tons and tons of protests. So many of the the protests that I participated in were through tears because I just hate the thought of the babies being killed and I, I don't want that to happen. I want them to go and have happy and fulfilling lives. And the only consolation is that I firmly believe, uh, just as John MacArthur teaches, that all the babies are elect of God uh, if they die and they go straight to heaven to be with him because the Lord is so merciful and gracious and loving. But they shouldn't have to die at all. And the whole system is now geared up towards this. You know, um, millions, even billions of taxpayer pounds in the UK and dollars in Australia and in America and elsewhere get pumped into these so-called women's health care, uh, so-called rights, and uh, uh, even bankroll uh, the abortion industry in the developing world. It's just shocking, you know, they, they even peddle abortion to Africa and Asia and Eastern Europe, and it's vile. It's vile. It's not enough to kill the babies of our own country. They have to go off and kill more. Well, Molech has an insatiable appetite, doesn't he, for human sacrifice, and nothing has changed. So I know that's a heavy story, my dear ones, but please, if you haven't signed the petition, consider doing so and pray that it's successful, and that they are able to um, lower down that abortion a legal limit down to 22 weeks, but please also pray that, my goodness gracious, abortion is obliterated and is ended and never returns in our culture. Uh, because this is why I call us neo-pagans. We're going back to um, infanticide, which is was a mark of the pagan religions before Christ. So tell me what you think in the comments. Uh, do you think that there is um, a need to lower to 22 weeks the uh, legal abortion limit? Uh, do you think that we will ever see abortion banned and removed from our society as I have often prayed that it would be? Let me know what you think in the comments uh, about the sanctity of human life. Okay, last story, which is a absolute laugh. You're going to love it. It's, a, it's tragic, but it's a laugh. Uh, the United Kingdom, here we have a, a small supermarket chain called Iceland, uh, which when we first moved here, my children... Uh, saw the sign for and thought it was a theme park until we went there and found they sell, as you would guess, mostly frozen goods. And uh, they also sell some some fresh goods, especially bread and bread products. And one of the things that they've sold this year <laughs> is hot cross buns with the cross removed and a tick put on instead because they said up to a fifth of customers are not comfortable with the Christian symbol of the cross. So they go and break a tradition that goes back to around about the 1300s, I think, here in the UK and of course spread to the colonial world, you know, in, in uh, the Anglosphere, even in America, they have hot cross buns and they've decided, no, we can't have these crosses on them anymore. We've got to put ticks. What does the tick symbolize? Oh, no one can tell me. No one seems to even know in all the articles I've read. It's just not a cross. So that somehow makes it okay. Can you imagine being such a raging heathen that you wouldn't eat a hot cross bun out of the, uh, the sense of offense you have because it's, it's got a, a little white cross on the top of your, your bun. Like, what is this? You, you know, these people need to, to just get a life. Get a life. They're, hot cross buns by virtue of their name. They do what they say on the tin. They have a, they're hot, they're buns, and they have a cross on top. One a penny, two a penny hot cross buns. Like, seriously. That's... Also, I think uh, a sign of, you know, petty virtue signaling. Look, we don't like Christianity either. Um, it's also, as well as that, uh, an interesting little case study in the secularization of the United Kingdom. We're getting more and more secular now to the point that the little things are actually sort of um, receiving the woke treatment, not just the big sort of uh, touch, big topic, you know, big hot topic issues. All that said... Um, there was actually a backlash against this. They're keeping the buns with a tick, but they've assured everybody that they also have your traditional hot cross buns there. So I hope they never sell a single one because it's a stupid gimmick and it's virtue sig signaling. Uh, but 
Uh, if they do, at least now they have an alternative for people who walk into Iceland and are shocked to find that the hot cross buns are not hot cross buns at all. They're hot tick buns. Goodness me, that was a fun episode in many ways, wasn't it? The hot, the hot cross bun, uh, but a heavy episode in parts as well. So thank you for being along for the ride, my dear ones. Uh, please let me know your thoughts to any of those things in the live chat or in the comments. It's good that we interact with each other as long as we're respectful and loving and gracious uh, as we can grow in the, the faith of the Lord. A little update on me, which everyone always asks about, so I'll, I'll gladly oblige. I, I don't do this out of any ego. I do this because people are genuinely concerned, and it's so much easier to do a vlog than to write an individual message or email to every individual person who reaches out to me. Uh, I'm doing well. Family's doing well. Um, Mrs. Vickers a little bit poorly, has been on and off for a while, so please pray that the Lord would strengthen and heal her, and that the Lord would protect our children as well. Um, Emmanuel's doing quite well. We've had a number of newcomers come and engage. A lovely lady come to Bible study this week who hadn't been before. Uh, and we've also had two or three inquiries in the cafe about the nature of uh, traditional Anglicanism and what kind of worship services we have. So glory be to God. The Lord is building his church. He continues to build it. Um, we have received as a gift, which is amazing, uh, a baby grand piano, which I'm chuffed to bits about. Praise be to God. And we've also uh, had the um, volunteer efforts of a retired professor of Hebrew. And he's come in to teach some people at church in a class how to, re to read and speak Hebrew, the original language of the Old Testament, which is pretty awesome when you think about it. And he's doing that completely free from the goodness of his heart just to see the church built up and growing in their knowledge and faith in the Word of God. So there you go. Uh, that's basically it for us over at Emmanuel. That's it for this episode of the vlog. Uh, I pray the Lord Jesus blesses you and sanctifies you and strengthens you to walk with him and to fight the good fight of faith in a day and age where everything seems uh, very confusing and topsy-turvy. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that as we stand firm on your word, please bless us richly so that we may, we may be a blessing to others and continue to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for watching, my dear ones, for tuning into the vlog. Thank you for being such attentive and faithful subscribers. I pray for God's bl richest blessing on every one of you quite often. Uh, thank you for all those folks who have sent me private messages. It takes me ages to get back to you because I've got literally hundreds piled up, but I will do my best. And uh, Lord willing, we will see you either in the next vlog, uh, in the next video, on the live stream at church, or in person at Emmanuel Markham. God bless you and keep you, and may he send his angels to watch over you. Goodbye and good night.